All righty. Welcome everybody to today's brown bag presentation. I am Dane. I'm one of the student assistants here at Ollie. Um, and so, yeah, let's get started. So uh, welcome to the meeting first and foremost. My slide is working. Uh, so during the meeting today, um, if you have any questions during the speaking, uh, you're more than welcome to raise your hand and put your question in chat or just save your questions at the end. Um, all are good options. And oh, if you need to uh, do a reaction or anything like that, this little diagram right here kind of shows you where these tools are at. Um, so if you wanna raise your hand, uh, click reactions, raise your hand. If you wanna chat, just click on the chat box and type it in. And next I wanna do a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that Cal Poly Humboldt is on the land of the Wiat peoples, which includes the Wiat tribe, Bear River Rancheria, and Blue Lake Rancheria. Arcata is known as Gudini, meaning over in the woods or among the redwoods. Wiat peoples continue to remain in relationship to these lands through ceremony, culture, and stewardship. Knowing the history of this area is important and we value the lifelong learning. And I also just wanted to give a big thank you to all the friends of Ollie. Um, our program would not be possible without your support and your help. So thank you to all the friends of Ollie and also to our volunteers. Uh, and now without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Jane Woodward, who's going to introduce our guest. Kidoki, and I'm very happy to welcome Sorrel Oberlander who's Dean of the Cal Poly Humboldt Library and Interim Dean of Cal Poly Humboldt College of Extended Education and Global Engagement. That includes us, Ali. So we're very happy to have him here <clears throat> and give us an opportunity to explore the library and the multiple innovations that have occurred. And if you haven't been there, he's going to tell you about the fact that there's going to be a tour and the tours are available at the library. So Sorrel, all yours. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for having me. It's great uh, to be here with you and what an honor to be with uh, folks who believe and are truly inspiring about everyone learning and it's a lifelong learning that matters. I'm gonna share a bit about the Cal Poly Humboldt Library and if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, I do want to say that libraries are about curating and inspiring learning, research, teaching, collaboration, and creativity. And it's one of the things that we're going to talk about. And we do have a half million books. In fact, I'm going to ask you this question in a, in a second is, when you think about a library, most people in most studies say they think of books. And it seems appropriate given that we have a half a million books waiting to be read. And that is if you read one a day, 1300 years of fun in your hands. So um, please start early and um, enjoy. Today's conversation is really about the role of libraries in community and innovation. And very much books are there in familiar and new ways. And I wanna mention, that prior to COVID, the library approximately had 4,000 visits a day. So it's a very healthy library. And in 2018, we held over 2,300 events in the library. Since being open mid-January of 2012, um, after 22 months of being closed because of the seismic retrofit in COVID, I'm happy to report that the library and community are coming back strong and thank you all for your patience. I really sincerely mean that. One thing about books is they're really about a people and we're gonna talk about that quite a bit today. So thank you again for your patience. I wanna share that um, what ends up happening is we were closed for 22 months and you can see on the left side here that the library had its ceilings removed so that sprinklers was added to this as a result of the uh, seismic retrofit, it required sprinkler systems. And then everything was covered in a mask of plastic for a while and we really had to um, put 
this all back together in a couple of weeks in January to get it ready for spring semester. So I'm happy to say, whew, we're back and we invite you to come visit and see what the library is about. I'll share that these are some images of the library. They don't have people in them. They're taken by me while we had the place um, finalized and I'm gonna share a little bit about it. On the right side, you'll see up at the top, the brain booth where there was a massage chair, there's a bicycle desk, there's bean bags, a great way for students to relax and do origami or be coloring, playing games so that they have a de-stressor at times. There's a really cool chess game if you're interested. Also, uh, folks wanted me to share that there is a nice collection of amazing videos and children's books, all of which you can check out. And they're a great collection. The children's books are actually getting evaluated to diversify and modernize, get some new materials in there. And over here, there was actually a lactation room added to this space so that folks with small children could um, benefit tremendously by having a lactation room available in the library next to the children's books appropriately. I wanna share that the library has a lot of new study areas and it's been adding them in for about four years, maybe five now. And um, really we opened up a lot of spaces so that students could study near the windows. This used to be where a lot of the periodicals were and now a lot of the periodicals and government documents went to the lower floor. You see a lot of tables for study and a lot of computers for collaboration. These are really popular areas, although the photo shows no one in it. That's because I snuck in and took a lot of pictures before opening day. <laughs> we also have a lot of group study areas that I'll be talking about that we designed at Humboldt, uh, the Cal Poly Humboldt Library that other libraries are now emulating because they like what we've done and certainly our students do too. So I'm going to share a little bit more about that. Our fishbowl, where you see the major reading room here, it's very open, well lit now, thanks to the changes in the ceiling. That's one of the benefits of a seismic retrofit and um, our sprinkler systems. We have now a safer building and um, we have new lighting in most of the building. We also have a very beautiful collection of artwork and this is a, a a canoe that was built by an artist and students. I'd encourage you to really walk around, but I will also invite you to a library tour that I'd be happy to, to uh, provide you. Now, I also want to mention special collections. It not only has a new location with beautiful shelves and glass walls, but it also has a nice, beautiful website too. And um, I also want to say that it's new photo database, thanks to uh, the help of Joan Berman and others, is really a phenomenal resource for you to look at our collection of images, our collection of maps, and so much more, whether you're doing studies of the local area or if you're studying the university archives, all of which are a lot of fun, I think. Now, this is some of what you'll see in the library. Also, you'll see things like an author's hall. If you're wondering what an author's hall is, is imagine we try to connect authors and readers. And sometimes we really want to make sure that everyone knows we are all authors. And what we try to do is we highlight all the authorship of Humboldt State faculty or Cal Poly hum uh, Humboldt uh, faculty, staff, students, emeriti, and alumni. So we collect them, we put them here, we celebrate every Valentine's Day, about Valentine's Day, the author's celebration. And it really helps everyone see that everyone can be an author and we support that with our publishing. You'll notice on the posters here that these are all the authors that we heard of um, in the last year. So we roughly, showcase about 600 authors every year that have published from Humboldt and we're so proud of them and we really appreciate them very much. Now I wanted to share oops, uh, one thing about IdeaFest. 
one of the things the library tries to do quite a bit is to celebrate the works that we do. So not only is it the authorship, we celebrate these research, creativity, and scholarship of everyone in the academic year. So if you're not familiar with IdeaFest, this is what the library was like a couple of Fridays ago. So I'm gonna show this small video. I hope you can hear it. Now you're probably wondering, was that really the library? Yes, it was. Now imagine that you have dance, music, theater, film, all produced and, and uh, shown in the library. It's an amazing place to really celebrate the creativity and the scholarship of the campus community. And every year we hold this event and you're all invited because it is so much fun. Uh, although I had to talk two and a half hours about the digital dissection table, which we'll get to later. I'm serious. The library has some interesting changes. And um, thank you for letting me talk about that um, idea fest. Every end of the year, we celebrate it in the library, and I hope you'll join us sometime. So in the chat, I'm going to ask you all to please help me understand who are you if you could share your name and what is your favorite place in a library, how would you describe it? So if you don't mind taking a moment in the chat and say your name and it, what would be the way to describe your favorite place in a library? It doesn't have to be our library, it could be the public library or any library. If you'll take a moment, I'll appreciate it. And don't worry, there's no grade on this test. It's just a sharing out. <laughs> well, I will share one of the things that I like about um, the, like the cafe. Yes, that's a great one that I enjoy too very much. I think um, one of the things that I enjoy most about the library, about the favorite place, is I actually think of the whole building because I walk around the library so much. For me, it's seeing where are people, what are they doing in the library? That is my favorite. And it's probably why I, um, folks see me a lot in the library in the afternoons these days is because I walk around the library. And Cheryl, you're right, it's hard to choose. Now, if you were studying, it might be one location. And if you were relaxing, it might be another. If you wanted to connect with people, it could be another. History stacks, I love the paintings, I agree. Historical reference files, excellent. Thank you all for sharing this. Sometimes what a library's favorite place looks like this. Um, folks tell me that they used to sleep here or they used to study here. And everyone has a kind of a, a group of favorites. But what is happening in the library these days and a lot of academic libraries is places are starting to be added to the library to diversify how people learn or relax and really succeed in the library. So there's a lot more about making. And making with Legos is about relaxation and creativity. If you're spending way too much time on a calculus problem, which is easy to do, sometimes you need a little break, you wanna do something different, and then you come back to the calculus problem and you resolve it. Sometimes it's collaborating with people in the, behind the whiteboard walls, or sometimes it's presenting your work in a poster session. It's the cafe, it's the flight simulator. There's so much about the library 
that has expanded to include other types of learning because we're starting to understand learning and learning environments better. Increasingly, it's about collaboration, presentation, fabrication, augmentation, and simulation. They've become integral to the learning landscape. And I plan to elaborate on some of this as I go. So thank you for listening to this part and sharing your favorite places. Because uh, recently somebody had shared that, oh, I like those reading chairs that are soft with high backs. And we found a couple and we put them in the stacks. So it's really important to hear what are people enjoying most about a library space and shaping the library with those intentions. Now I'm gonna share that the role of libraries is many. We have so many stretches in, in our world and it's a fun one. We wanna provide an inspiring opportunity to empower learners. And in the academy these days, the future of higher education and learning is changing so much and it's becoming more competitive. So we really have to be the kind of space and the university that is incredibly appealing. In fact, most of our eighth and 10th grade visits, um, potential students down the road visiting Cal Poly Humboldt all stop at the library because we become the showcase for prospective students. It's the flight simulator, it's the augmented reality sandbox, it's the virtual reality. Those things help inspire people to want to go to college and get through all the barriers or boundaries that exist between there and here. So we wanna make sure people come. We inspire the learners by connecting with them. We curate the curiosity, collaboration, discovery, and exploration. It's all about the learning research and scholarship. It's what makes working in libraries so darn rewarding. But I think I'm talking to folks who love libraries, so I'm so glad you, you understand this. I encourage folks to visit and to engage in the resources and services that are provided here. You'll hear about our library publishing efforts, our, our interest in working with class making class assignments more than just a report, making them a real world connection. Our library is stretching again. We want, uh, folks have wanted us to stay traditional, meaning quiet study near books, as well as students want us to be collaborative spaces that are a bit more noisy or filled with technology. And so we're stretching to meet many needs and we try to reduce the conflicts of use and have done, an, amazing job. The road ahead is an adventure. Entrepreneurship, makerspace, creating a 360 panoramic theater to immerse folks. Imagine if you were in a room that you could see all around you a tide pool or a forest canopy. And up close, you can see data that's specific to any species in that environment. Those are the kinds of spaces we'll be creating in the library because that's the way learning is going. And it's still going to have books. So we have a half million books and I'm gonna guess we have a half million books 10 years from now. Our lifelong learners are making the most important contribution to what a library is. They're bringing their imagination to the library and that is very welcome. They're bringing their creativity and of course, Data. Data and creativity are all part of changing the world. And I'm going to share how we changed and why. We did a, a number of analyses about the library to prepare for the seismic retrofit. We looked at the print periodical use. Our journals definitely showed a decrease in use and, and check out our circulation transactions did too. A lot of these things are real, really important indicators of what's happening in this environment that we need to think about in the future. Perhaps the most important data we realized was where do people sit? It's one of the greatest things, it's how people vote and in many ways is where people sit tells us very much what people enjoy or where people enjoy to sit. 
And I've got to say that the 26 librarians and library staff and 50 some student assistants and library partners have all made Cal Poly Humboldt's library one of the best in California. And I'm going to explain some of the reasons why. This was the third floor in 2015. You can imagine the beautiful windows with a great view for the government documents to see out the window. And this was a wonderful, amazing collection that was the least used collection in the library because government documents are notoriously difficult to use and hard to find and discover, especially because they aren't very well cataloged. In 2018, we changed it so that most of the government documents went to the basement and we opened up the space for students to study in the window area. And we created this amazing special collections area. And we saw a dramatic increase in use. Easy to see why that would happen, but it took a lot of work. We moved every half book in the half million collection and we moved out a lot of shelves. In this move, it took us moving out 3.5 tons of steel, which is about two Priuses, if anyone's counting. <laughs> so kudos everybody for that. We opened up an engaging space that is used for events, used for learning, and it's an open classroom. This concept of you can teach in a room without uh, walls, because you're inviting everyone in. Very much what extended education is about. Everyone uh, learning for everyone. The changes in the library were designed in many ways with an intentional idea that the first floor would be very student service focused. So the learning commons was brought in. So all the tutoring services are there. The, checkout desk, the textbooks on reserve, because nobody should be buying a textbook for $300. And the technology help. The second floor is all about collaboration. So it's a lot about the events that happen in the library. And the third floor, well, that's a lot about the innovation and advanced research. So it includes the special collections library, as a library collection, the scholarly communications and center for teaching and learning wanted to share that there was some design frameworks that, that helped us understand what is the best use of our space. But what made the best difference is where do people sit? Now, Cheryl knows all about this. She helped create this tally here. So kudos to you, Cheryl. <laughs> Thank you. Now, imagine somebody walking around the library 20 minutes a floor circling everybody who's sitting in every location in the library and then tallying up that information well how much well four sheets per floor three floors 12 sheets times about 50 surveys and you have this nice stack of, of works that uh, you have to go through manually and say okay what was the average use or what was the total numbers Thank you, Cheryl, by the way, you did an awesome job. 2015, it feels like a lifetime ago, but this data helped us so much because what it gave us is a starting point. In 2015, the first survey showed that most students study by themselves. And later, all, all after this, most students study in collaboration. And why was that? Well, let me show you an example. Uh, actually, before that, I'll show you the difference between 2015 and 2018. In 2018, the same space would show a huge dramatic increase of 206. This is the method that we used by, by individually tallying up all those 600 sheets. This is software that students helped write and develop and um, share which allowed us to count the average per use of a piece of furniture in the library, an area in the library, or the whole floor of the library. Why would any of this stuff matter? Well, we have to make decisions. What do people really most want? We can ask them, but it was better to observe and actually make the decisions based on real data. It was also a big surprise because we learned that 
way back in 20, oh gosh, 2015, I noticed that there were only five whiteboards or so in the, in the library. And I uh, was able to work with sponsored programs to bring in a hundred mobile whiteboards in the library. Right away, we noticed a shift towards two or three people sitting together and then creating little walls of rooms made out of whiteboards. This was fascinating behavior because we were thinking, wow, okay, people want a little office made out of whiteboards. So thanks to Keely Wilson, the budget analyst and others, we designed a new structure of, mob, of uh, modular walls, whiteboards, and enabled these to be what students really like about studying. And they've become the most popular study spaces in the library. Uh, every, the only thing that gets more use in terms of seating is the computer lab. So we designed these and I'll just share that one thing to note is between 2015 and 2018, that same space has become much more highly used um, in the library. This modular wall system has been interesting because in the interior areas, it gets 50% use on average per seat. And at the ends, 25%. Now that may seem like, oh, too much data about uh, specific seating, but it told us how to design the library more to the needs and interest in, and uh, what motivates students. We learned long ago that power outlets determine where chairs are because people will drag the chair to the power outlet and <laughs> that's where it stays. So oftentimes it's important to acknowledge what people do more than sometimes what they say they want. So that was what we did. And I'll just share that the students who helped us in this project to automate this process, um, we hired students to basically develop software and they developed what's called space use. It allowed us to walk around and do a tablet and plug in where everybody is sitting and what they're doing and it renders an analysis for us so we don't have to spend hours making tally marks. It has been incredibly powerful as an instrument that has guided us for the last several years into continually improving our library and our average use went up every year even though our enrollments were in decline. So that is how important this kind of data is. Now, these three, uh, Ben, Sam, and Eric, they developed this software and I got them, I got a couple of them to present it at the American Library Association to 80 librarians in Washington, DC. In fact, I brought them into a vendor booth where they could share and understand what it is to be a business to libraries because if they wanted to take their software and make it a business, I wanted to show them what it's like. So much of what we do in libraries is augment the curriculum by giving real world project-based learning. And it's one of the most powerful things we can do to student employees or to students because they have an incredible opportunity when they work with us. In fact, the students helped co-author this article that was in the Chronicle of Higher Education, and it shows a stellar example of what it could be like to have a portfolio of not only writing software as a computer science student, presenting it to a major library asso or association, professional association, and uh, publishing in an article in the eminent journal for higher education. So what they've been able to do is really leverage that. A couple of them went on to get computer software development jobs. And uh, Vera, Ben, is now working with us to update space use so that it's available for everybody easily as a, a standalone application. So it's amazing what students can do if we combine what is called a project-based learning opportunity 
with how do you solve a real world problem? And they did, and what an accomplishment it is. Now, I'm gonna go back to one of the most important things the library does is it hires students and it helps transform their world. Cheryl knows this, Joan knows this. I think you all know that employment really does matter. And we have a couple of ways to employ students. One is the student employee who checks out books and sometimes works on software development. And the other is we do paid library scholar internships. This is a powerful form of real world projects that are also connected to what the students care about. So a student could be working on the Humboldt Redwoods project, or we are your community, understanding uh, how we belong in a community, making it a multimedia production. Or it could be creating websites um, in Omeka, the websites that show the Go Road or um, Northwest Genocide. These are incredible experiences for students because they can show in their portfolio, I've helped develop a website, here it is, and you can see my work. This is also an incredibly important thing to think about, um, how do you share history? Well, you have students engage in looking at the history and writing a website and creating a a way of taking the past, digitizing it, and making it relevant to the present and to the future readers. So one of the things these internships do is do some incredible work that um, is very powerful. Now, the most recent uh, intern, Ann Howard, created something called the Eureka Chinatown 360 Virtual Tour. You may be aware of that, and I want to commend um, Ann Howard for, and the Clark Museum for collaborating on that because it really shows a way to look at the history and make it relevant today and provide the context that's often missing in terms of when we walk the streets of Eureka, do we know what's, what happened here? Do we remember the history? How do we engage that history? That uh, was one of the interns that made a difference. I want to also have a sincerest thanks go out to the Rhodes and Atkinsons for creating a library scholar endowment that makes it possible for the library to pay a library scholar intern each semester. That makes such a difference because they leave this experience transformed with a portfolio in hand and we all benefit from it because we learn through their eyes and through their voice. The education lasts a lifetime. And um, I just wanted to share that uh, if you're interested in knowing more about this, I'll put the showcase that Ann Howard in the chat so you can look at it later. And thank you again for your time on this one. I also wanna share one of the internships to two internships that really made a difference in their lives, and I want their voices to be heard. So Erica and Amanda produced this book called the uh, YES, the Youth Education Services, 50 Years of Community Building. And um, when they first went to the publication uh, release party and they got their copy of the YES book, um, Erica was jumping up and down and they were they were the first time they really worked together and they were just so happy and saw each other. I mean, and each of them tell a story of what a difference it made to publish a book together. One was the archivist doing a lot of the archival looks for what happened in 50 years with the YES program. And the other did a lot of the writing and uh, text layout. Both of them came away with this incredible experience and appreciation for our wonderful program, the YES, and realized what library publishing could mean, which is it makes a huge difference for a student to be a part of a publishing landscape and become an author. 
I'm going to ask, has anybody been an author? Can, if you want to put your, your title of your book in the chat, that would be fantastic. If it's not a book, it's an article, please go ahead. If it's a website, when we produce something for others to read, we make a big difference in, in lives. And I'll share that the Cal Poly Humboldt uh, Library is one of the most phenomenal publishers in the state of California, and we're the only CSU press. So we have something that used to be called HSU Press. It started in October 19, 2015, and now it's called the Press at Cal Poly Humboldt. Why is a library getting into the library publishing business? Well, our job is to connect author and readers anyway. So one of the best ways to do it is to help publish because we can't afford to buy every book. And in fact, we really want to empower students to be authors, to be a part of this world. Our goal is that all students have the opportunity to publish before they graduate and publish their creative or scholarly work. And that helps transform the way teaching is done and the way research and scholarship work. Imagine this, if you're turning in an assignment to a professor, it's an important thing to get a grade, but that's it, right? Usually nothing else happens to that work. If you are publishing it, meaning it goes to the instructor and it gets published in the rest of the world, readers read it. And then it means even more. So these are the downloads since May 15th, going back several years, of all of the works that we've published. We publish about eight, uh, 600 authored works a year. And what a difference it makes to know that your voice is being read all over the world. Now I'm gonna show an example of this that really um, we find is incredibly important to us. And that is the Courageous Quentos Journal. It is a journal of counter narratives. It's every uh, year, the Ethnic Studies 107 class, two, two classes, two semesters, they author a number of stories that is produced in a journal and it's online for free and in Amazon for really inexpensive, $3.59 for this one. And what a difference it makes to be published. So I'll share it this way that these are very happy students and these are very tearfully eyed uh, listeners to the stories that these students as authors read to us. And the reason is it's so powerful is because when the student held their work in the printed book, it mattered more than if it was an electronic copy of anything. The printed book matters a lot. In this case, it's a journal, but it's something that they could show their family and friends and say, I'm an author, I'm an author. We want our students to have that experience. We want them to have that portfolio and we do so much work behind the scenes to support this. And it's transforming the way classes work as well as how scholarly communications work. All of this is traditionally done by commercial publishers, which we spend about a half a million dollars for every year to rent the use of that collection, which was produced by faculty and staff at all the colleges and universities. We need to see a different way that works for us. And one of the ways we find really compelling is, do we wanna make a difference in the lives of our students? Yes. Can we? Absolutely. How do we wanna do this? And how do we build this up as a reputation? We're already great in the CSU system as a library publisher. But now some of the programs that are publishing journals are also seen as a very attractive academic program because of their publishing experiences. So Courageous Quentos is nice. Now, behind the scenes, I want to share that, yes, we have 600 authored works, but in no way could we just say, Kyle, can you take care of all of this for Sarah? We have 
many students that we hire and give them an incredible opportunity to learn how to do publishing work, how to do copy editing, text layout, peer review, graphic design, and marketing. Their experiences with how to get voices like the Idea Fest Journal or African Mass of Burkina Faso and Mali by James Gash is incredible because they have the opportunity to share student voices, learn incredibly valuable skills before they graduate and continue on in whatever they want to do. I want a special thank you to Jerry and Gisela Rodi who have provided funding for both Ollie and the library. And part of that funding is to, to support endowments that support the, the publishing efforts at Cal Poly Humboldt. These are efforts that really do make a difference because I think in next year or two, we will achieve our goal of every student author before they graduate. Now, I just wanna put in a plug for Jerry Rohde's book that's available in Digital Commons and uh, Humboldt Bay Shoreline and say that this fall, you will see three books that uh, Jerry is publishing at, with Cal Poly Humboldt's Press. And um, we're gonna celebrate together Ollie in the library early this fall. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> Now I'm going to give you something of a, a walkthrough of why publishing matters. If an author publishes traditionally and the library buys it and shares it, that's been the traditional model where we connect authors and readers. You might think of it as the past connecting to the present and future. What we do in our model is the author and library publish the research or the work. The library still acquires it, but it's free on the internet meaning everyone can download it and read it. There's no cost. And we sell an affordable print. The difference here is we're also connecting students and more readers. That's, if that is one of the core values of a library, library publishing fulfills that core value. And that's why we make such work of how do we support everyone be an author? And we are open to community authors as well. So um, everyone's invited. Here's an example of the YES book in, in uh, Amazon. And here's the free version that's downloadable. Now books are just merely one form immersive, of immersive technology. It's when we read a book, we would imagine things and it's very powerful. There are many forms of immersive technologies in the library. And part of it is because we have to increase how we visualize information and how people engage with interactive interfaces. The flight simulator here with Dave Marshall, it was built by students and it's an amazing tool to learn how to fly. Everyone's invited, it's free. The instructions are right there on the wall. And there's even a training mode so that it'll walk you through all the steps to learn how to fly a Cessna. Well, you could actually pick the plane and pick the airport to fly out of. And so I encourage you to imagine flying an airplane at the library. The augmented reality sandbox down here, this was also built by students. These are uh, geospatial students that tried to put together an augmented reality box that you adjust the height of the sand and a map, a topographical map is overlaid on it so you can imagine how maps are made. It is one of the most engaging technologies along with the flight simulator and virtual reality that students come in and visit the library when they're at eighth grade, 10th grade, or if they're just happen to be visiting. What a powerful way to introduce them to the college life because they leave the library thinking, this is amazing. And in fact, the eighth grade and 10th grade feedback for visiting Humboldt always shows the library is their top place, their favorite place. And a lot of these are the reasons why. This new thing that we just recently got, a digital dissection table. You're probably wondering, a what? <laughs> 
I don't blame you. <laughs> That's Siri trying to join me, forget it. Um, so this uh, digital dissection table, it is our way of showing how learning has changed so much. So imagine it has four human cadavers and 150 animal scans to explore in way too much detail. It's touch screen, so you can, you can see a lot of a human body if you're interested. You can see how body parts have been damaged, have recuperated. You can see artificial knees. You can see so much detail. And it allows people to explore the understanding of anatomy, kinesiology, nursing, wildlife, and zoology, and so much more. We have to create these opportunities for students to explore and be curious about the world and their lives in ways that we all are interested in learning. Whether it's a turtle or a human, it's amazing. In fact, I never realized that the optic nerves and that the nerves associated with the eye go down to your stomach. I never knew that until I used this machine. Oh my gosh, what a strange world we live in or are. And um, I just wanted to share that in the library, there are tools to help inspire and discover and learn. And books and visualizing tools like this are part of that world. And I wanted to share that on your tour, if you're interested, we'll actually show you this. Now, I also want to share that um, we do a lot of work with our students on projects like Citing Insights, which was a software development. And you'll notice these students here are presenting to library and Center for Teaching and Learning. And there's Tom Gage, who is very interested in assessment and trying to understand how do we better assess the world that we live in, our academic papers, and make it a tool that makes our job better. So solving our real world issues. There's another innovative student project called Discovering Humble. We had several interns work on an issue of, hey, we have about 700 students, every freshman, new student arriving in our campus with the most important question on their first day. What's there to do around here? How do we answer that? Well, we found out that we asked them a lot of questions about what's your favorite place? And we learned what are their favorite places. But to get the word out, we had to do something. We could put a guide, we could put a flyer, but where is everybody searching? And we realized everyone searches on Google. So we discovered a way to put Humboldt's favorite places on Google Maps so that everyone can find it. Annika Slattery did an amazing job of teaching people how to use Google Maps um, to put, um, to identify cool places. And um, I started doing Google Map reviews during COVID because I was so tired of being stuck in Humboldt County and not having to travel for a while. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna find every favorite place and photograph it. 3000 photos later, um, 11 million views of the photos in Google shows me that there are ways that we can take student projects and change the way things work, solve some of the problems that we see. Solving the problem of what is there to do around here, which is a retention question, is now also a solution to a recruitment question. And it's a solution to a tourism question. So, one thing about it, student projects are amazing and they're so much fun. Now, what that taught me is that I like a challenge, especially when I'm a dean in two different areas. And one of the things we were thinking is after my experience with the dissection table, meaning when I see the touch screen and how it works, I thought, this is interesting. I wonder if they have anything about flora in this kind of a tool. There isn't a tool like this. 
So what's next for a student project? I'm thinking a GIS project. If you're familiar with the geospatial information system, um, there are ways to layer different information like old photographs, like the aerial photographs of Humboldt County with current photographs of Humboldt County, with maps of Humboldt County, with vegetation maps of Humboldt County, with city um, species information, and really make it an interactive tool to understand Humboldt County. So I've talked to some of the geospatial faculty, and I'm talking to them this afternoon about the idea. Uh, Boudica is an amazing professor here, as well as many of the others in ESM, forestry, and, and geography. Boudica writes articles with students, and in this case, it was in the Idea Fest journal. And this was a study of at Patrick's Point, which is now a new name, um, looking at the invasive species of English ivy. And so they've identified where the ivy is either fast growing or slow growing. So it can help how to do preventative maintenance by identifying certain characteristics that they should be aware of. Well, this is an example of a student project isolated and it fits a certain kind of a project, but it's in Humboldt County. How do we get more of these projects associated with Humboldt County and layer them into a touchscreen device or a website so that everyone learns more about Humboldt County, much like the dissection table? So I'll let you know what the GSP faculty say about this idea, but I'm interested in this because I think it could be a multi-year project to really understand some of the changes that are happening today, what has happened in the past, but begin to model what's likely to happen in the future. That's how fun a library is. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go on to a couple more things that you should definitely hear about the library. We have amazing instruction librarians, and not only do they teach information literacy in ways that is very engaging and, and covers so many disciplines, they, in cooperation with others across the campus, teach workshops called skill shops. If you're not familiar with them, please know they're free, they're 50 minutes, and they're super fun. Uh, some are asynchronous, meaning you can take them online at any time and get a badge for them. We had 1,009 badges earned this spring making a total of about 2,000 badges this academic year. There are face-to-face -face classes, Zoom, and asynchronous classes. And I encourage you to look over the website on our library homepage about what is the skill shops like? Because in fact, you might find one of interest and enjoy them. This summer, we we typically have something called L4HSU, which is a lifelong learning lounge at HSU. We're in the renaming stages, thinking that maybe it's going to be L for humble, learning for humble. But I wanted to share that in 2019, we had a theme called Building Strong Community, and we had 700 attendees. It's free summer programming that's super fun. In fact, um, we used to also have a version of it called uh, Wacky Sock Wednesday. So in case you have wacky socks and want to join us on a Wednesday afternoon, let me know. But we have a number of things. Cheryl um, has managed uh, the, and facilitated the rock painting, and it has been an inspirational program where you come in and you paint with other people. And it's really a very collaborative effort to just maybe talk a bit, paint a bit, be creative. And at the end of the, the mini sessions over the summer, the campus is populated with these rocks so that the new students coming in get very positive messaging and discover treasures like these painted rocks that say, you got this or other things, because it helps people at a time where they're saying, oh my gosh, what did I do? I moved 300 miles away from my family. <laughs> well, they do have this. And thank you, Cheryl, for being a part of the, 
for leading the rock uh, painting effort. That has been wonderful. Lifelong learning matters. You all know this. You spend a lot of time on this, and, and we appreciate your support of this. But one of the things that really is a good question I'll be raising later is, what is the future of lifelong learning in our community? Now, you might want to know what's happening in the near future or in the far future of the library. One is we're going to try to build a 360 uh, projection area so that folks could look, uh, as I said, they could be in the middle of a canopy or in the middle of a tidal pool and see data and uh, see interactives that help them understand what's happening in a tide pool. For folks who it's inaccessible to go there, this gives this the environment closer to them. So a 360 camera in a tidal pool area will capture the sound and the visuals that then you project in here and then talk about what you're seeing and work with what you're seeing. We're also talking about audio and music recording booths. We get a lot of requests for music recording. We'll be moving the makerspace to the second floor this summer, excitingly, and we hope to update the flight simulator. And we've got to create a special collections and archive space that's controlled, that has a controlled temperature and humidity because our materials are getting older. And if they're left to the natural humidity and heat, um, they won't last too long. Now, using the chat feature, I'm going to encourage you to say, what suggestions do you have for the library? Or what are your big ideas for the future of lifelong learning? If you would, I would appreciate hearing from you and uh, seeing your chat about what you think the suggestions are for the library or their big ideas for the future of learning. Don't all jump at once. I think the suggestions for the library are going to be fun because um, you have a chance to think about it and say, what have you seen elsewhere that would be nice at our library? Oftentimes, I see the spaces in airports and other locations, and I think, oh, that would be nice in the library. So what have you seen maybe not in a library that would make sense in a library? that leave this open for a little bit. And then also say lifelong learning is you're gonna see more attention paid across the nation to lifelong learning in the academy. And part of that is because the number of 18 year olds are decreasing and becoming very competitive. And so in higher education, more and more people are trying to say, it's really a lifelong learning model that we should be paying attention to. And that's actually very true. But how do we do it in a way that makes sense? And those are gonna be questions that we have to answer because the reality is, is Ollie has already answered is a great answer. How do we connect Ollie or do we connect Ollie intergenerational or multi-generations so that we can learn together? Somebody shared an idea of citizen science. There are others. Can we have library? Yes, of course, that would be fantastic. <laughs> in the library, we would love that. Parking is always seems to be an issue, but not in the summer. <laughs> uh, so please think about this and I'm gonna share a couple more things and I'm gonna open it up for questions. I do need to let you know of one thing. Um, Ollie, we're going to be sending out an, an email out in June regarding changes to remote access to databases and interlibrary loan privileges. You know, database vendors, they're kind of, um, well, they stink. Um, we've always signed an agreement with them that said on site, everyone can use the databases, but off site, meaning remote access at home, only current students, staff, and faculty can use them. We've done this, uh, all libraries do this because that's the only way to get the publisher to agree to rent the faculty authored works back to us. And we have to change the setting 
so that OLLI members aren't considered current students for remote access. So you'll always still have access to our databases and e-journals from the library, but just not from home. And that's something that is out of my hands. I, I wish it weren't the case, but you can see why I'm trying to be a publisher is because we want everybody to have access to these things. The other is interlibrary loan privileges are limited to students, faculty, and staff in Emeritite. It was a setting in years ago that allowed OLLI members to have access to both, but we're gonna to try to make these adjustments effect, take effect in July. And I sincerely apologize for this inconvenience and please let me know if you have a question, comment, or anything about this. Now I'll say thank you for your time. I'm really interested in having you come to the library, if you're interested, Thursday, May 26th at 2.30, and I'd be super happy to give you a library tour, answer questions, talk about what you see, give you time to fly in the flight simulator or try virtual reality or um, uh, try the digital dissection table. But you're always open to be in the library. Another opportunity that you might be interested in is Reese Hughes is talking about Crossing Paths, the new book, at 5.30 to 7, May 25th. And I encourage you to think about um, joining us for that as well. I'm going to try to stop sharing. OK and open it up to questions and see, one, if you have any questions or suggestions for the library, because this is shaped by you all as well. Ted, do you want to talk? Uh, the uh, traditional system of publishing books is uh, protects the readers. You have to have readers if you have publishers. And we're getting flood, the library is already a flood of information that readers don't have time to read. And these are books that have been reviewed, so their quality is known, affirmed already by the reviewers. So I don't see how you're protecting the readers in this Creating, uh, creating a new flood of books that are not reviewed. You've asked one of the most powerful questions and one of the services we provide is peer review. So you're absolutely right is that there are easy ways to publish in CreateSpace and other programs that are print on demand and there are more books produced now than ever before. It keeps to increasing. And one of the ways we do um, protect the readers is we do have a peer review process built into it. And good question. I think you're going to create a, a large flood of published material <clears throat> that is not reviewed. So I don't know what what do you do about that? I, I think one of the ways we do it is we ensure the quality through peer review and selection. And um, uh, when I was at the Charleston conference years ago, when I was in New York, um, one of the experts in the field said she was worried about libraries as publishers because librarians don't like to say no. And I love that question because she was making a very strong comment, a very appealing one. And my retort, which everyone laughed at, was basically, I've learned from university presses that they actually don't say no. They say revise and resubmit. And so <laughs> what we learned is that from our university press colleagues is there are techniques that we need to do in library publishing to make sure that if some author isn't ready to produce or publish, we have a mechanism that they have to work through. And thankfully, it's an old tradition of saying, 
revise and resubmit with lots of suggestions. But thank you for that question, Ted. Very good one. Other questions or Daryl, suggestions? Daryl, I have a question. Dixie, for, good to see you again. Thank you. It's good to see you. And I really appreciated your review. You know, <clears throat> I'm very old and all this new way of learning is not my way, but I see how very, very popular it is. I'm over at the library two or three days a week. I love the place. And I see how those spaces are so used by the students that I have to realize, okay, I'm old school. This is working. These kids are great in those spaces. Every one of them is working very hard. So you've done wonderful things over there. Just amazing things. They're not for me, but they're definitely working for the students today. And so I applaud you for that. I wanted to ask you, I am very interested in uh, studying, I'm doing some studying on the vagal nerve. And if I use that diagnostic table, could I look at the vagal nerve throughout the body? You, I don't know that nerve, but yes, you can look, you can look at all the systems and you can display only those that you care about. And Dixie, thank you for your remarks. I, I really appreciate it. I think you should have given the talk, not me. So anyway, no. <laughs> one, thing, <laughs> one thing you can do also that I didn't mention is if anybody out there has their own MRI CT scan, you can load it on the table to view it. So <laughs> fortunately, I don't have any of those, but that's a very good thing. That's a great asset for older people today. No, it's one of the 12 cranial nerves. And I want to know, I want to see the entire pathway. So I'll come over and try it. Yep. Uh, you, if you want to drop by when I'm there, we can make an appointment and I'll guide you through it. Thank you very much. I oh. really appreciate that. And thanks so much for all that you're doing. It's really uh, paying. It's, it's all the faculty, staff, and students. I just bring yeah. chocolate to the game. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very Thank you. much. It's very yeah. tasty chocolate. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments? I think this is a wonderful idea. And, and I think that it'd be fun to actually have a get together for Ollie at the library where we could walk through uh, a tour with you. And perhaps we could do that um, either, we could possibly do it in the summer. I think it's still an opportunity and that might be a better time to do it than in the fall. But I think it'd be really fun if you'd be interested in proposing a, a class or an adventure that we could basically come to the library uh, formally as part of Ali uh, membership to uh, make our way through and see, actually experience what's going on at the library. What do you think of that? I think it's a great idea. Maybe even a little reception with chocolate. <laughs> that sounds good. That sounds good. Let's pick a date and let's do that. Well, and right. please feel free as you do get to know the library more and think about what you see in it that you like. Some people who are doing business use the library as a space to do some office hours while they're there. Others are, enjoy the creativity. Others enjoy just reading in a soft uh, reading chair. There are so many reasons to be there and to be engaged in what's happening and be a part of the lifelong learning. And so you're invited. And if you have any suggestions, I'm in room 109. So in the library, as you walk in on the far right, I'm usually there in the afternoons. In the mornings, I'm over here in, in the College of Extended Education in SPS 211. So you're always invited. That's fantastic. Anybody else have any ideas? I think I think the concept of having intergenerational communication could be facilitated through the library as well. Because I think that's an issue for, for many of us, unless we have grandkids who invite us in, but they often have their faces in front of <laughs> smartphones. So we need to create a forum to allow that to happen. 
I like that a discussion forum or even a project that might be a shared value between Ollie and the students, because it's oftentimes the projects or the challenges that we face that when we work together on, it makes such a huge difference. And uh, we always have challenges to face, but we wanna do it collaboratively. And I sincerely appreciate all of you and um, again, open to hearing from you at any time. You have my email or you will in a second. So let me make sure you have it. And um, know that I hope to see you at um, the library. And my email is in the chat in case you want to email me later. Thank great. you all very much. Thank you. This is, was a great presentation. I had no idea the kinds of things that were going on at the library or a very slim idea and have not had the opportunity to come over and visit. So I'll try to do that on Thursday. And meantime, uh, on May 23rd, next Monday, we're going to have a history of the Arcadia Community Forest and the ch climate uh, challenge of climate change. Mark Andre, who's currently now the city forester, and he was really incredibly uh, responsible for our wonderful forest because he worked as head of environmental services for I don't know, 20, 30 years <laughs> for the city of Arcata. So we wanted to capture all that knowledge before he decided to fully retire and not just stick around part-time. Um, so we'll look forward to seeing you. It's our last brown bag lunch for the uh, summer spring session. And we'll reconvene for two sessions in the summer, the last two Mondays of July. And after that, we're going to camp. So, You'll have fun, I think, learning about the kinds of things we're doing this summer, which will happen, you know, probably next month when we get all together. And, and I think it would be fun to have a tour of the library as part of that. So let's go for it. Thank you all for coming. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Take care now. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you for joining.